today we look at uh, two of the essays. I hope you have been able to take a, at least a quick look at uh, both the essays. One is a, a, a book chapter, well, I think you know the um, uh, Iyengar's book also has an introduction, we are not taking a look at the introduction and this is the second chapter where he talks about the beginnings Ram Mohan Roy. So, it is like there is no ambiguity at all over here about the kind of starting points that uh, Iyengar wants to designate for Indian uh, literature in English and his literary history is called Indian writing in English. Yeah. And um, uh, why do we take a look at uh, Srinivas Iyengar because it is he is considered as the first person who uh, started writing about Indian writing in English. Uh, also he was the first person who uh, called this <coughs> body of writing as Indian writing in English for the first time, who debated about it, who started teaching Indian writing in English to uh, students especially if, uh, initially in abroad and later uh, to students in India. So, in multiple ways Srinivas Iyengar is a very important figure for us because he in, uh, in, in many ways he brought this to the level of uh, uh, you know elevated Indian writing in English to the level of a different uh, discipline altogether, initiated a number of uh, 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 historical and critical studies in this field Indian writing in English. Yeah. So, uh, today we look at uh, Srinivas Iyengar's uh, this uh, one of these chapters, the beginnings Ram Mohan Roy, and also uh, the uh, another chapter from uh, Priyam Vada Gopal's work. Yeah, and uh, we look at both of these works in connection with the discussions that we've been having uh, regarding the introduction to uh, introduction to the history of Indian writing in English, to the history of how. Indian uh, fiction and uh, in, a, in a large uh, scale Indian writing in English how they get located in the history of Indian literature itself. Yeah, Because uh, we also took a look at how there are these shared origins and how uh, at after a certain point because of various political and linguistic differences there are these two distinct camps which are uh, which are also getting generated in the contemporary. So, mm, uh, Iyengar also begins in a very typical way. He, uh, you know, uh, looks at. He takes a backward glance at the beginnings. Yeah, from the beginning, he looks at you know the colonial, uh, uh, the, the the colonial uh, uh, starting points and how the British encounter, the British uh, domination, the culmination of the domination was essential to identify. Again, he also talks about the early 19th century as the starting point of uh, Indian uh, English writing. And uh, some of the events that he talks about, we have seen. Uh, at a later point, Mehrotra also reiterating a number of significant events such as the Battle of Plassey, the uh, significant ways in which you know the East India Company as well as the uh, British Crown exercises various kinds of dominations over the uh, subcontinent. And uh, and in this uh, the, the probe that he undertakes into the uh, e etiology of this body of writing, etiology of this uh, uh, you know uh, this uh, distinct kind of literary tradition which was to emerge from the late 19th and early 20th century onwards. He uh, sp he speaks about Indo uh, 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 look at the kind of term that he uses it is Indo Anglian literature when he talks about uh, Indian writing in English. It is initially Indo Anglian literature. We also need to spend a, time, uh, a minute or two about the, the terminology the nomenclature being used. In fact, in the 60s, 70s and even in the 80s there were a lot of debates about how to name this body of writing whether it is Indo Anglian literature or whether it is Indian literature in English or it's, uh, uh, whether it should be called Indian writing in English. Yeah, so, we can you, we can see that all of these terms have been used, used interchangeably, but uh, this term Indo-Anglian which was in uh, vogue maybe in the uh, uh, 70s, 60s and 70s uh, we can say and uh, used very marginally even in the early 80s, now it is not really used much. Yeah. Instead, a more neutral expression of either Indian writing in English or Indian literature in English is being used. Uh, so, that those are because Indo-Anglian also uh, talks about the colonial connection, it, uh, it, it invokes a colonial connection in a very direct manner. So, it is not really uh, used much in the contemporary. So, um, having said that uh, he talks about Indo-Anglian literature as a kind of literature for which the it is easy to trace the history he says. Why? What is the reason he gives? That is in the, in the first paragraph itself. He says it is easy to trace the history because it is fairly a young literature yeah? and you can trace its history with a certain amount of you know certitude he says. Yeah? And also uh, he ta talks about uh, how you know the 17th and 18th century you can uh, find those in the first uh, couple of paragraphs of the, of the 17th and 18th centuries where uh, a spectacle of decay and misery and by the end of 18th century India also begins to appear as a 
wasteland. Yeah. So, in some way, he is identifying the colonial intervention, he is identifying this advent of modernity, the beginning of English education, all of these things with a, an emancipatory zeal. Yeah. There is a uh, and, and, and this is evident uh, throughout the discussions of not just Iyengar, but also in most of the canonical writings that you would uh, see in the uh, particularly until the 80s. There is a way in which uh, some kind of a significance is always attributed to this uh, uh, the, the aspect of colonial modernity to the aspect of colonial uh, education, the, uh, uh, the beginning of English education to such an extent that it's, it, it almost uh, reeks of uh, a certain orientalist uh, 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 flavor. Yeah. So, and uh, uh, it's it also in the same uh, uh, in the same piece you would also see uh, uh, Srinivas Iyengar referring to the orientalists as Brahmanized Britons. Yeah. So, that's a kind of rhetoric that we begin to see in some of the earlier uh, writings. Mehrutra in that sense is uh, uh, very different. He is also using a more politically uh, neutral language and he is also more uh, perhaps you know he also has the advantage of writing in a uh, writing at a time when uh, post colonialism is already at, at its peak. He is more aware of the nuances of using particular kinds of terms, aware of the dangers inherent and the politics inherent in certain other kinds of phrases. So, maybe you know he also has that advantage of staying away from certain sorts of uh, um, usages which could be uh, termed problematic. But uh, uh, Srinivas Iyengar, we do not see him you know the language is also if you uh, notice very flowery and uh, some of those things really do not mean anything, but you know he just uh, articulates them in a very pompous fashion. Yeah. Going on through some of the uh, major points, he talks about this particular moment, yeah. he also invokes the French literary historian. Yeah. Uh, Tain, if you remember in uh, one of our earlier sessions on uh, literary criticism, we spoke about the moment, the milieu, the raise milieu and the moment as part of historical criticism. Yeah. Historical critics look at these three aspects. So, he invokes Tain here and talks about the raise, the milieu and the moment he identifies at as this moment of the meeting of the West and India. So, here right from the beginning, there is a very clear sense of absence of violence over here. It is like a meeting, a very peaceful meeting. It is not like a, a colonial imposition at all. You find this uh, and different kinds of very peaceful neutral uh, phrases being used throughout the discussion in Iyengar and later you would see it in Naik uh, to refer to the colonial encounter as an accidental or serendipitous kind of a meeting which does not have any kind of violence, any kind of hierarchy inherent in it. Yeah. And uh, then he talks about uh, 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 a way in which you know the uh, India, uh, he also uses the term India, there is no other way in which he refers to uh, the, the subcontinent, though India was not yet formed in continually we find the term being used. So, you need to be alert to these things, not because you know he is not aware of the fact that India had not yet been formed, okay, because there are, there are no other ways in which you know you could refer to this uh, common uh, geographical land that he is talking about. Yeah. And then uh, Moving on, he talks about you know a number of influences that were part of this colonial encounter, such as you know uh, what East India Company did and the role played by the uh, Christian missionaries, and also from the beginning of the 19th century onwards, printing press, private schools, Western education. Yeah, so there are a number of good things that he lines up one after the other, which are also consequently the byproduct of this meeting between the West and <coughs> India, and. Uh, there is absolutely no sense of a, uh, a, a colonizer colonized relation uh, which is uh, being invoked over here. We are not reminded of any of those things in this discussion. And uh, moving on, yeah, we will uh, we'll not go into the details of you know how he talks about uh, in, and particularly in Madras, he talks about how a colloquial knowledge of English was considered much more common than in uh, Bengal. He uh, talks about you know how the presence of English men, the presence of the uh, many things related to either the English uh, um, uh, East India Company or the presence of the <coughs> colonial governance was leading to a naturalized emergence of language being used in a colloquial sense, not necessarily part of uh, Macaulay's minutes, not necessarily part of a creative expression. Yeah. So, uh, moving on from there, then he begins to talk about Ram Mohan Roy. Yeah. So, come to this page, uh, page number 27. Uh, first, he talks about Ram Mohan Roy's uh, plea for English instead of Oriental education. Uh, 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 Mehrutra uh, fleshes out this uh, in a little bit of detail, saying 
Sanskrit was also seen as the language of darkness. So, they also wanted the language of modernity to be a part of the modern uh, education, modern formal education. Here Iyengar says, page number 27, are you all there? Uh, first, there is a uh, fairly longish uh, excerpt and then nay more. Ram Mohan Roy not only wanted English and more English in India, he also wanted more Englishmen in India. Yeah? So, this sort of a uh, rhetoric about you know a certain social reformer, yeah? asking for the presence of English, asking for the presence of Englishmen, this is very important, this, this uh, the, the act, the agency associated with the role played by Ramu and Roy is very important. It is not as if language or the presence was imposed by a colonial master, imposed by a colonial intruder. Here, uh, Iyengar is presenting it in such a way that it is all because Ramu and Roy knew the, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the potential, the possibility associated with English, he was asking for more. It is one uh, thing to say that he was aware, Ramohan Roy was aware of the possibilities of English education vis-a-vis -vis a traditional uh, Sanskrit based education, but it is yet another thing to say that he insisted on English and insisted on the presence of English men more and more. Here in fact, uh, 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 whether consciously or perhaps you know uh, uh, inadvertently, Iyengar is resorting to this neutral a presentation of the colonial encounter about English being introduced because there is this peaceful relationship and also because the uh, more enlightened reformers knew about the possibility. There is absolutely again I reiterate no sense of violence, no sense of imposition, no sense of hierarchy which is uh, you know which we get a uh, uh, which we uh, we are told about. And then he talks about Macaulay as this Macaulay celebrated minute yeah the following paragraph. And moving on, very categorically he says from 1835 was the anglicizing period. Yeah? And here you know in the same paragraph itself, yeah, we, 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 we are not trying to undermine uh, Iyengar's work in any way, but I am also trying to alert you to some of the contradictions which are part of particular kinds of history telling. Yeah? In the same paragraph, he begins with from 1835 was the anglicizing period, but towards the end, uh, let us see the last. Um, the last sentence of the same paragraph, it should also be added that even before the Wood Dispatch, vernacular education had taken considerable strides in Madras and Bombay, only Bengal being almost wholly under the fascination for English and English alone. So, there is uh, there are these set, uh, uh, series of events that he talks about in that paragraph. In the beginning, he is over enthusiastic to talk about the significance of 1835 minutes as if after that it was English and English alone. But towards the end of the paragraph, uh, he sort of you know, uh, uh, he uh, tapers it down to saying, yeah, English and Madras had an equal kind of a fascination, but it was more in Bengal. Yeah? So, it is not as if the entire nation was in this uh, fervor for anglicization after 1835. Yeah? There is a gradual process, somehow most of the dominant historians, uh, particularly the canonical historians of the uh, 60s, 70s and early 80s, they seem very reluctant to talk about it. They, are, they want to talk about 1835 minutes as a mega event after which there was no going back and also a glossing over of the many things which would have happened the 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 the, the tussle between tradition and modernity which would have ha which would have happened because it was not just about language it was also about particular tradition particular cultures which were being privileged over uh, one over the other and uh, then he talks about the uh, 20 years between 1835 and 1855, yeah, here you know this, this detail which he gives, it is very interesting. It said that even in, uh, are you all there in page 28, the second paragraph, yeah, it is said that even in 1834-35, 32,000 English books sold in India as against 13,000 in Hindi, Hindustani and Bengali and 1500 in Sanskrit, Persian and Arabic. Yeah, this is actually very, very interesting and uh, Priya Joshi, one of the uh, critics and literary historians. She uh, has uh, got a very wonderful piece titled uh, Reading in the Public Eye. She talks about the circulation of uh, uh, li books and libraries in 19th century. This is in fact a set of works which were translated from English into different Indian languages. This was in the 19th century and this is very, very remarkable. If you look at it, see pre 19th, the D4 Fielding, Goldsmith, Johnson, Swift. Then uh, uh, Balwa Lytton, 
uh, Collins, Reynolds, Scott and also Taylor and a few non-British works, yeah, such as you know the world literature kind of works, uh, Aesop's Fables, Anderson, Arabian Nights, Boccaccio, Cervantes, Dumas, yeah, do you see it is a very, very impressive list and look at the footnote she gives. Each of the titles was translated into at least three Indian languages and there is a star against the titles which were translated into four or more languages. Yeah. So, quite an impressive list. Yeah. And this is later in the same essay, it is a very interesting essay and uh, later you know she also talks about this list excludes the adaptation such as you know uh, if uh, now yesterday we uh, spoke about how Indulekha was initially meant to be a translated work and then it becomes an adapted work. This, this kind of an attempt excludes all those attempts at adaptations, yeah, the various kinds of you know uh, retellings which were adapted from British works. So, in a way perhaps uh, the, uh, anglicize, uh, the anglicizing period that uh, uh, Iyengar talks about in a certain way it is right, yeah. It is not as if you know people suddenly started talking in English, but a certain a certain kind of influence of English education, a certain influence of this process of anglicization yeah, was uh, uh, taking effect through these translations, through the various other attempts made by printing presses, uh, the missionaries, the, uh, the private uh, uh, English education uh, which was being offered by different schools. Yeah. So, in multiple ways this was operating. Yeah. And this period as uh, Mehru Drahi details it uh, even further as we have seen you know, uh, after 1835 there is also an equal amount of energy that we see in the vernacular scene in terms of you know creative writing, in terms of education. Yeah. We find that the vernacular writers are also benefiting a lot from this, uh, from, these, uh, from, the, uh, from the western education, from this encounter with the new kinds of uh, modernities. Yeah. And now come to the uh, section where he talks about uh, a, a number of things which happens, you know, again at the end of page 28, yeah. Uh, he talks about how in 1824 Lucknow looked almost like a western modernized city, uh, 53 is first railway, 54 is first telegraph line, there is a modern uh, postal system which is being inaugurated. So, a number of new developments which are which also signal modernity in multiple ways, they all happen in the 19th century almost simultaneously. Now, come to this section in 29 where he talks about a particular moment yeah. and we um, will just uh, read that section together, page 29, the last para, we will begin from the line just before that. He quotes one Arthur Mayhew and says, under English rule in India, the impact of two civilizations may have produced unrest, yeah. note the choice of words, may have produced unrest, but it has also sustained stimulated life. It is an extraordinary story of endurance, assimilation and integral transformation. Such was the moment, Iyengar writes, the phoenix are that bred into Anglian literature, sometimes with solemn self-consciousness, but sometimes as naturally as self-consciously as leaves upon a tree. Yeah. So, there is a, you know, a conscious attempt to see the anglicizing process as a natural process, yeah, it's like leaves on a, like leaves grow upon a tree. In fact, both in Iyengar and in uh, uh, M.K. Naik's work, you will see a number of these analogies, yeah, uh, using, talking about the influence of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the various colonial aspects, like a very natural thing, like leaves on a tree, just like, you know, uh, the fresh, uh, 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 the, the, the plants. Uh, sprout out right after the fresh rain. You see a number of uh, such analogies being used by most of these early writers. Yeah. So this, um, um, what do you think about this? You know, this uh, almost a, a sense of negation of this violence. Yeah. I'm not necessarily saying that we should always be invoking only the violent moments, but this conscious attempt to continually talk about this being a very uh, uh, as if there is a very amicable relation which was always already in place, look at the terms that he used, it may have produced unrest, yeah, those are like you know very uh, negligible things, the moments of unrest yeah. and it has sustained and stimulated life, an extraordinary story of endurance, assimilation, integral transformation. Yeah. So, why do you think Iyengar is doing this? Certainly he was not uh, uh, you know a bad man to talk about history in such terms, what were the compulsions perhaps? He's writing in the 1960s, 70s. 
any any quick thoughts on this and it's not just an ayangar in fact we would find you know a number of works which uh, in, in fact you know it's not just about the colonial encounter either if you look at the history books there is a way in which you know particular incidents historical incidents are glossed over like partition yeah we are, we are not uh, uh, we we're not really directly told about the kind of violence that it produced we are only told in a very peaceful way then partition happened india was formed pakistan was formed but we know it's it's not such a neat narration Uh, which you uh, know, not an event which uh, you know uh, entails uh, such a neat narration. So why do you think he is also doing this? Do you think the problematic, you know, invoking the problematic colonial history? Do you think it would hinder this process of uh, history telling? Yes, Shweta, you were about to say something. No, I was just thinking. I suppose it, it is possible to certain authors invoking. Violence or certain historical events that appear to have no direct bearing on the development of literature, as such, they could be viewing it as not entirely divorced proceedings, but ones that do not need to come within the scope of this. Yeah, it's not very important for us. Yeah, maybe that's what they thought. Yeah, one wouldn't know for sure. Yeah, but if you again, you know, if we come back to Rushdie, not Rushdie the editor, not Rushdie uh, the Rushdie who wrote that introduction. Rashti, who authored Midnight's Children, yeah, or say Amitabh Ghosh, who authored um, Shadow Lines, yeah, maybe you know they are coming back forcefully to that aspect of violence, yeah. They are not talking about; they are talk about the violence which was part of not just the uh, uh, the 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 polity and the geography. They talk about the violence which was part of the language, yeah. They talk about the violence which also, in 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 certain ways, you know, resulted in a. and in very violent internal conflicts between traditional and modernity yeah how you know this also even at a later point through different kinds of partition that the nation occurred it was also emotionally pulling the nation apart yeah so they all talk about not this history yeah which is very very interesting while the 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 stage for indian writing in english is being set by a number of such historians when the major figures when they begin to talk about the nation it's not this story it's as if you know they are talking about two different nations altogether yeah so maybe in the 1960s even in the late uh, early 1970s there was a need to talk about these encounters talk about the past in a very holistic neat fashion because uh, ours was a very young nation at that point of time we were still grappling with a number of issues yeah so one doesn't know maybe the historians the literary writers the uh, the reformers the cultural activists and all those who were at the forefront who were articulating uh, who were in the position to articulate these various things must have thought if you just gloss it over yeah perhaps things are going to be fine these are just the teething up uh, uh, troubles that we are having things are going to be fine but it took us maybe almost 50 60 years when midnight children happen uh, when midnight children is uh, being written it is you know right after what even there are many many things happening at that moment yeah there is emergency yeah soon after that the 1984 riots so indian english writers are also being made aware to the fact that it's not just okay to just you know shove it under the carpet it's important to talk about it because even this glossing over has not done as any good yeah so maybe that is why at it's at a very very late moment that indian writing in english begins to engage with the nation in a very different way yeah after perhaps decades of engaging with the history of the nation in the way in which we see exemplified in works such as ayangas yeah and uh, it it's again you know i i want uh, yes yes ranjini this clarification i'm really confused is is ayangas a conscious or unconscious decision to leave it out and wouldn't know That's what I was about to say. It is again not to say that you know this kind of history is wrong and that kind of history is right. It's certainly not about the person. Not certainly not about the men and women who are writing it. It's also about particular compulsions. Maybe you know he also wanted to present it in a good because Iyengar's work. There is no way in which we can undermine it because had it not been for Iyengar, we would not have identified this body of writing together. Yeah, that there were set of uh, people writing in English from here and there. He was the one. who identified the possibility of this being uh, seen together as say in indian writing in english or into anglian literature and the possibility of tracing a history exclusively for this 
uh, uh, writing. This was not, you know, because of only after Iyengar's work, we see that Indian writing in English not just a uh, sort of a side dish as part of, you know, the larger scheme of Indian uh, uh, literatures. Yeah, this has a major history. It also has a legitimate share of intellectual tradition, as you know, he, uh, he he very consciously does that part. Yeah, but to respond to Ranjini's thing, whether he's doing this, leaving out a bit consciously or not, one wouldn't know. But we have to be very conscious about the fact that that has been left out because we are also placed in a very different uh, at a different vantage point in history when even Indian English uh, authors do not really entirely subscribe to this idea of a very uh, 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 peaceful, non-violent encounter with colonial uh, uh, modernity. Yeah. So, Nelson, did you want to say something? Did you? Yeah. yeah. Yes, just, uh, he talks about uh, Ram Moon Roy. Right? Yeah. So, it has to do, I think he is conscious, somewhat conscious of what, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, the Ram Moon uh, the importance of the intellectual movement yes. that is coming and he focuses more on that yes. rather than on the hist historical part of the uh, violence or whatever. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, so uh, I think uh, he is a little conscious in regard. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, also another point in connection with that, when he is talking about Ramohan Roy, yeah, perhaps you know all the more reason for us to expect that maybe you know because why was Ramohan Roy in the uh, forefront uh, in the first place? Yeah, it was not to engage with a movement, engage with the colonial encounter, which was going in a very smooth way. Yeah, he was also there in the forefront to respond to a number of things. Which was, uh, you know, uh, which were being toppled after the uh, um, after the colonial rule, or maybe you know, he was also responding to a number of things which were not really okay, even in the internal scene, in in, in terms of you know, uh, religion, the social reform, so on and so forth. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to comment on whether that was a conscious thing or not, but yeah, I I do buy uh, Nelson's argument too. Yeah, if he's talking about certain things and not talking about you know, a set of events associated with it. Maybe it's a conscious decision to uh, take one particular trajectory other than the other. Yeah, and uh, he talks extensively. Since this chapter is also about the beginnings and uh, Ram Mohan Roy, yeah, he talks extensively about Ram Mohan Roy and the Renaissance that begins with him. Yeah, yes, Ranjani. Yeah. There is a small distinction in taking a historical approach and a political approach in a sense because while he is observing and stating what is going on, he is not necessarily commenting on it and making it a slightly, it, it, it makes, makes the reader take sides when he says something to the effect of so and so happened and this was a good thing or this was a bad thing. Right. When you are taking a historical stance, you are supposed to be a little more objective. So, maybe right. in that sense, he right. avoided the whole thing altogether. Okay, fine. So, uh, uh, if when I mean, he talks about the uh, Renaissance, yeah. he 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 uh, presents Ram Mohan Roy as a central figure. So you we find this pattern in all the literary histories which are being written about Indian writing in English, whether it's Iyengar, or Nayak, or uh, Mehrutra. There is a homage that they all pay to Ram Mohan Roy, irrespective of whether he wrote creative, uh, you know, creative writing in English or not. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, this, like you know, he extensively engages with uh, Ram Mohan Roy's work and life, the kind of reform movements that he were part of, and particularly gives a rationale for identifying him as the first of the Indian masters of English prose. This is in page 33. Yeah. Are you all there? Page 33, the para which begins Ram Mohan, although he could be named as the first of Indian masters of English prose. Yeah, he was great in so many fields that he belongs to. Indian history more than to mere Indo-Anglian literary history. Yeah. So, here is where you know there is a connection which is being continually maintained with the story of the nation, with the larger sense of you know literary history, social history, cultural history and the history of Indian uh, writing in English. Yeah. Then he also talks about uh, you know he started the tradition of Indian leaders writing autobiographies and how all of these uh, modern autobiographers yeah he talks about Mahatma Gandhi, Nehru, Surendranath Banerjee, Rajendra Prasad, M. R. Jaikar yeah may proudly trace their lineage to him. So, it is a very different kind of a history which is being invoked over here. Yeah. Not necessarily again you know this also uh, 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 tells us that the history of Indian writing in English is not really a literary history. Yeah, it's 
just like you know, no literary history can uh, remain in isolation with the political, social, cultural forces. The beginnings are very, very effectively traced back to a number of socio cultural and historical uh, uh, forces. Yeah. And Ramu and Roy being there uh, at the beginning is you know just one of the uh, symptomatic things in connection to that. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah, and uh, this idea about the Bengal Renaissance or the renaissance in India beginning with Bengal. It has been very heavily critiqued by a number of uh, uh, scholars. We will not go into the details of this now. Maybe at a later point when we talk about certain related things, we will address uh, you know, those things again. Uh, and also the emergence of you know, a set of people known as Bhadralog. Yeah, you must have heard about these, you know, the Bhadralog culture, which is also being heavily critiqued in terms of the critiques against nationalist historiography. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, we, we uh, looked at Iyengar to get a sense of, you know, how there is a shared sense of history, how there is a way in which e Indian literatures also share in this origin, in this intellectual tradition and more importantly to show how the, Indian, uh, the story of Indian writing in English runs parallel to the story of the nation. It is impossible because so far, you know, we have not really uh, 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 discussed any of the literary works in general. Yeah, just like you know, most literary histories would fashion. It's important to set the stage in such a way that the literature that you are about to discuss is first and foremost part of the political entity that we are about. Uh, we are talking about. Yeah, here we legitimately w w because w one of the reasons for positioning Ramohan Roy or for talking about. Uh, Indian national movement, the uh, early renaissance which happens, all of this is that we also need to legitimize Indian writing in English as an offshoot of, a, as a very Indian thing, as an offshoot of many, many things Indian, the Indian struggles and uh, the Indian encounters, yeah, so on and so forth, yeah. And a brief thing from Iyengar again, this is in fact part of his introduction, I have given, uh, if you see the page numbers, after 33 you have 8 and 9, yeah, do you see that one? So there is one uh, first, you know, he, he begins, uh, he is also very skeptical about how far Indian writing would go. Yeah? So in that sense, he thinks it is very important to make a set of appeals to all those people who matter. Yeah? So now we may think uh, uh, that, you know, he is also trying to, uh, 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 trying to privilege the uh, Western critic or he is trying to privilege the uh, 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 maybe you know the, the, the hierarchy in certain ways because he is still not very sure of the position that Indian writing in English will eventually occupy. In page 8, the first para is to you know I would tell the Indian critic, yeah, do not let uh, cheap nationalist sentiment color your warp your critical appraisals. It is more like you know a warning to the Indian critic to be more sympathetic to Indian uh, writing in English, do not be dismissive of it thinking it is more, uh, it, it is you know the uh, writings in vernacular uh, literatures are more loyal than the writings in English and then there is an appeal to the creative writer in England yeah? and uh, there you know he also talks about uh, hold out your hand in friendship and fellow feeling out to the Indian writer in English. He has a mind and the soul not very different from yours. Yeah? So uh, a sense of you know he is trying to get the uh, uh, establish some sort of a fellow feeling with the writers in uh, 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 England and uh, the last line in that same para. Perhaps if not in one way in some other way, if not today at some other time, the Indo-Anglian writer would himself be able to make a token or even a full return for what now he receives. Let him not suffer cold neglect and die for want of air. Yeah? So it is, uh, uh, now maybe you know this may look like you know very cringeworthy and the, 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 given the kind of position that Indian writers in English currently occupy in the global uh, scenario, but maybe this sort of an appeal. Iyengar must have thought is needed to secure a fairly decent position for the Indian writers in English. And the last one, to the critic in England, I would say about, you know, again, uh, the last line sort of sums it up. Yeah, in between, you know, he also talks about to the uh, critic in England, give it first a dog's chance at least. Yeah, so that is a uh, kind of uh, uh, appeal. He is willing to go down to any level so that the uh, Indian writer's position. Indian writer, uh, the Indian writer 
who is writing in English, his position is very safe. The last line, your fair mindedness and generosity of understanding can go a long way in the future as in the past in giving deserving into Anglians that nod of recognition and smile of encouragement that he will always need and always prize. Yeah. And this also needs to be seen in the wake of you know the many many rejections that a number of early Indian writers in English had to uh, you know, face. Yeah, uh, Anand's um, untouchable. Yeah, it said that you know he went to about 19 publishers and all of them had rejected because they all thought it was very filthy and dirty because it was talking about Indian toilets, yeah, which a Western reader would want to read about, you know, such filthy things. Yeah. So, this is also in the light of these many, many rejections that the Indian writers, the early Indian writers had to face globally because when Iyengar is writing, the Rushdie Mormon had not yet arrived. They were not even in a position to dream that eventually a Rushdie Mormon would happen in Indian writing in English. Yeah? And uh, this passage is very interesting in page 9 towards the end. At one time, again, you know, the there is, uh, you see repeatedly uh, a compulsion in Iyengar's rhetoric to create a very neat sense of non-violent history. But you see that uh, line towards the end of uh, the second para in page 9. At one time, over a century ago, awakened and enlightened opinion in India wanted English education, the importation of Western ideas and techniques, and the fusion of the best in our past with the best in Europe's present. By 1857, consolidation of British power under the East India Company had taken place, and after the brief, brief nightmare of the mutiny, yeah, this in fact, you know, many others also have critiqued Iyengar rather uh, vehemently. Because 1857 is supposedly the first revolt of Indian independence. It is like a brief nightmare of a mutiny. The crown took over responsibility from the company. Yeah, it, This is like, you know, it is as if, you know, it is a, uh, the nation, India itself, it is not like, it is not seen as a colony. It is like a small firm which is maintained peacefully. Yeah, There is a brief nightmare of a mutiny. So, the crown takes over responsibility and everything is fine. Yeah, From 1857 to 1900, English education took rapid strides and the climate was favourable for a new flowering of the creative Indian genius. The next 20 years saw a further spread of English education, but there were heard the notes of dissent and a discontent also. Then came Mahatma Gandhi and from 1920 to 1947, he led a unique revolution against the British bureaucracy in India with sudden storms and uneasy lulls alternating till the British divided the country and withdrew as a political force on 15 August 1947. Since then, we are going through the ardours and trials of reconstruction, sometimes elated by hopeful vision, sometimes depressed by gloomy, gloomy no, forebodings. Yeah. Again, this is not to blame the historian who is writing over here, but maybe there were certain kinds of compulsions in the early post-colonial period that the nation, the writers, the historians were also facing to present such a picture. Yeah. But uh, this this passage has been extensively and vehemently uh, critiqued because you know many were extremely unhappy about the ways in which uh, he had glossed over a number of very very important things which happened in the nation, not just in terms of political history, but it was also important to the uh, the, the 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 history of literature. And uh, uh, you would also remember how Mehru outlines uh, the uh, discussion of the language bills. Yeah, how it was not the discontent was not. Uh, uh, not at a very, uh, you know, subtle level. It had led to constitutional reforms. There was a need for political intervention. The the tussle between English and Bhasha, it was not. We we also, you know, know about the many many instances where anti-Hindi agitations had gone violent. So it was not a, a, a something which happened in the way that Iyengar is presenting uh, it to us. And so. Uh, very quickly, we will take a look at any, anything that you want to ask or add. Also, uh, uh, Iyengar's uh, work in, in, in multiple ways, regardless of you know the ways in which you know you can do a, a close reading of it and uh, um, tear the uh, text apart. In spite of all of those things, it continues to remain as a foundational work of. Uh, history of Indian writing in English. So, if you look at the framework that uh, Iyengar uses, you can see that 
though this was written late, he started, you know, working on this from the 60s onwards and the fourth edition, which is considered to be, you know, this is the one which is, uh, that's the one which is often used. The fourth edition came out in 1984 and uh, Mehrotra's work is 2002-2003. Yeah. So, he uses a similar kind of a framework. Maybe the rhetoric with which he discusses uh, the uh, these uh, set of events must have changed, but the overall historical framework, the overall uh, critical framework, it remains pretty much the same. And also, it is the same set of writers whom uh, Iyengar and Naik, the, the set of writers whom they canonized, they continue to remain as a canon of the early, uh, uh, the, the first two phases of writing. Yeah, which were the first two phases? Altogether, there are three phases, as Mehrotra puts it. Which were those phases? Yes. Yeah, 1864, it's the first yes, book, sir. and then <laughs> yeah, Gandhi phase, 1920s, 30s, and then and then Rushdie happens. Yeah, okay, very quickly we come to uh, making English in India. That's the that's a work by Priyamvada Gopal. Yeah. So pretty much she talks about more or less the same set of events, but she also brings into discussion some of the, you know, uh, recent scholarship, the recent uh, sets of knowledges which are available in the post-colonial uh, period, yeah. And uh, we will just uh, go through one or two things that she highlights. The first one is in page uh, 13, talks about in, uh, yeah, the last line. The idea of a modern Indian nation was arguably articulated in English language fiction before literature in other languages began to engage with the idea. As a literary concern, the idea of India was also tied it to two other challenges, writing prose and writing national history. We will not discuss this at length now because this is, this is also the crux of uh, many of the things that we will be talking about in with respect to a number of other works in the coming uh, sessions. And then uh, she, yeah, and now come to page uh, uh, 15, the last line in that section, the teaching of English literature, yeah, she argues, she is Gauri Vishwanathan, the author of Masks of Conquest, which is also excerpts of that work we will be discussing as part of this course. She talks about the role of uh, English education and how that changed many things uh, in, in, in modern India. So, the teaching of English literature, she, which is Gauri Vishwanathan argues, was seen as a way to disseminate English values without coming into direct conflict with native religious beliefs. So this is also, this also has to do with uh, the section that Iyengar himself talks about how, you know, there were a lot of English books being imported. Yeah. So, Gauri Vishwanathan and many others in her, their analysis, they say it was not entirely out of generosity because there was, there was a faction of uh, uh, the uh, British masters who also thought that the missionary activity was being too direct. It was interfering too much with the traditional religious belief systems. Yeah. So, instead of, you know, uh, making this very, very direct approach of uh, uh, Christianity and using missionaries, give them literature yeah, because they thought the, because remember that was the Victorian uh, England, yeah, where rudishness, Victorian morality, that was all part of the British ethos as well, English ethos as well. So, give them books which will teach values to Indians. If you remember your history of literature, 17th, 18th and even early 19th century, it was you know fraught with different kinds of moral attitudes, censorship. Yeah. So, they had already filtered the books which would add value addition, which would be part of you know a very moral philosophical approach towards life. So, those books would be imported you read them, you become good men and women, you become virtuous uh, women, you become uh, men who are useful to the nation, to the family, you uh, get a sense of, you know, what good life is, yeah, what is like, you know, moral, what is good for the uh, community. So, this is a better way of educating them. And if you, uh, uh, there are also a number of works which engage with how that has continued to be the basis of our education even today. If you look at, you know, the formal education that we all have had right from our school days, yeah, the idea of literature, the idea of history, the idea of, you know, uh, introducing us to anything which would equip us as better citizens. It is all about, you know, a value added education, value added literature, yeah. So, that is uh, perhaps, you know, 
something to discuss in another uh, uh, context. So, in page uh, um, 15 again you know she draws her attention to 1835 and uh, the Macaulay's minutes and its implications and also the following page which would be page 16. Yeah. She talks at length uh, of those two novels which came out after 1857. Yeah. She talks about the famous uprising of 1857 which generated a myriad sensationalist English novels was despite its undoubtedly large scale no exception yeah. and she talks about the violence, the uh, armed revolt yeah, etc. And this uh, can be connected with skip one page and come to page 20. She talks about two early historical novels, one of which has already been referred to by Mehrodra, Kailash Chandar, uh, that is a journal of 48 hours of the year 1945. The other one is published in 1845 by Shoshi Chandar Dutt. His work is The Republic of Orissa, a page from the annals of the 20th century. Yeah. So, both of these works are also seen as an offshoot of an emerging nationalist sentiment. So, right from the beginning, one of the things that uh, uh, say uh, Priyamada Gobal is also trying to say that right from the beginning, the Indian writing in English has always been about writing about the nation. Yeah, it is difficult to uh, identify a work or a set of works which do not really engage with the nation and this she also argues is much much more when you compare it with say Indian uh, literatures uh, in different languages. Yeah. And uh, please do take a look at you know the previous sections which we shall not be looking in detail over here. She, she also talks about Ramohan Roy, about Derosio, about Michael Madhusudan Dutt and also about you know how the uh, bilingualism was developing. Bilingualism was uh, maybe we can quickly take a look at this that aspect. Uh, she talks about bilingualism in page 19, one page before. She talks about the emergence of a vocal and articulate bilingual intelligentsia. Yeah. Do you see that paragraph beginning with by uh, 1835? Yeah. And there is a there is a particular description she gives to this bilingual intelligentsia. Come down a, a bit. What they had above all was the ability to define what it meant to be modern and to have a history and consequently what it was to be Indian. Because if you think about the 18th and 19th uh, century, even the early 20th century, one of the things Indians really struggled about what was how to be modern because there was this ongoing tussle between tradition and modernity which is the right amount of modernity that you can have so that you do not become westernized but you become uh, modern Indians. The other thing was a sense of history. Yeah? Uh, many of them have spoken about you know the absolute lack of history in the in this subcontinent because we were not trained to write history in a particular way and when one of the things that really surprised the British also was this 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 lack of history if you look at you know any kind of histories which were generated even about Indian literatures about Indian uh, languages we needed a western intervention over there because our idea of history our idea of tracing a trajectory was very very different yeah so this set of people the bilingual intelligentsia who in whom you know you can find the best of both worlds as the cliche would go yeah they knew how to be they had the ability to define what it meant to be modern to have a history and consequently what it was to be indian yeah because whether one is Indian or not, that is at the crux of the debate in the early 20th century in multiple ways about the ways you write and after partition is about the kind of markers, the secular markers or the communal markers that you have as part of your identity. So, these three things in fact, we can see say that these three things also differentiate Indian writing in English from say the many writings in vernacular because there is a way in which they engage with all of these aspects. Yeah. Maybe a consciously they engage with the idea of uh, modernity, the idea of history and also the idea of Indianness. When we look at particular novels, that are, uh, when we begin to look at uh, you know individual novels, we can see that there is a way in which they continually engage with the idea of Indianness, yeah, debating about Indianness. There are these uh, long debates which have been uh, you know part of uh, the uh, literary history about Indianness. Minakshi Mukherjee writes about Indianness, and there is Vikram Seth who takes, you know, uh, uh, who, who quarrels with that idea. So that it's fraught with the entire history, the entire articulations which emerge from Indian uh, writing in English. It's fraught with these three uh, ideas. Yeah. So uh, 
uh, uh, maybe you know as and when we discuss further we would also look at the ways in which the Indian writers in English as well as these critics have all together problematized these different uh, these different uh, ideas and these different uh, concepts. The sense of history that we had been trying to, I would not say that this is a very comprehensive sense of history now, you know, you know all about the history of uh, Indian writing in English. There is no way in which you can, you know, pin down and say this is the beginning and this is the middle and this is the, uh, you know, next uh, phase whatsoever, yeah. Because uh, um, as you read further, you would also know there are these number of uh, debates about, you know, which is the first novel, whether this is the first novel or that is the first novel, those sort of uh, debates are ongoing, lot of newer works are also happening. Mm. But uh, what uh, what makes it uh, easier and maybe more accessible for us when we look at Indian writing in English is that maybe the first so set of discussion, we are talking about uh, the, the history of say uh, uh, um, if, if you take 1864 as the starting point, yeah, you have like barely how many years? From 1864 till 154. Yeah. 154. Yeah, roughly about you know one and a half century of history. And in that, if you look at the actual productive years, yeah, maybe that is even lesser. If you take you know 1920s and 30s as a starting point, yeah, again we have again lesser number of years to deal with. But what becomes very very interesting in terms of the critical narratives, in terms of the storytelling, is that only by the, from the 1960s we begin to talk about this body of work in a historical or in a critical sense and only from 1970s Indian fiction in English gets very focused attention yeah that is with Meenakshi Mukherjee yeah so now we uh, uh, from the next session onwards you know we, we, we stop engaging with this larger dimensions of history uh, time and again we may revisit some of the things that we've already spoken about but otherwise we begin looking focusedly on the history, the story, the critical narratives and the actual works of uh, uh, you know fiction which came out as part of Indian writing in uh, English. So uh, Meenakshi Mukherjee starts engaging with this space in 1970s and that is the moment that we begin to look at in the uh, next uh, session. So for that I want you to her most important work is realism and reality that is exclusively about uh, fiction and she all, it is not just about Indian fiction, she also talks about fiction in general. So do you see that thing you know right after making English India, there is a preface to first edition and two chapters. I want you to read the, the, first, two, uh, the first two paragraphs of the preface and also go through the uh, next two chapters. Purana to Nutana and the novel of uh, purpose. Uh, the following week, we first look at again Minakshi Mukherjee's essay, The Beginnings. Yeah, that essay, in fact, you know, it's <coughs> it got tucked away somewhere in between. I think it is after Ayengar. It got misplaced somewhere in between. Yeah, beginnings of the novel. Chapter six, beginnings of the novel. So first, you look at realism and reality by Meenakshi Mukherjee. So next week we will look at beginnings of the Indian novel. This is in fact part of uh, Mehrotra's uh, larger work, Illustrated History. Very quick sum up. This in fact, you know, keep this uh, uh, framework in mind when you talk about the history, about you know, how the story of Indian writing in English begins from say the 17th and 18th uh, century India and then the colonial encounter happens, the series of events which also, you know, uh, you know, consolidate British rule in India. Then we have, you know, the role of missionaries, printing press, which these are things which you, you may need to revisit as part of your critical discussions on of other works. Yeah. Then there's important event of Bengal Renaissance, Ram Mohan Roy, and of course Macaulay's Minutes, which uh, is something you know even Rushdie revisits this in uh, very different ways. Yeah. Okay. So this. Uh, this outline that uh, uh, Iyengar gives yeah? and if you can find a set of works which would entirely depart from it that itself can become you know a different project altogether yeah? because Mehrotra as I uh, said earlier talks about all these things in a different way but the, 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 the set of events, the, the, the chronology, the tradition that he traces pretty much remains the 
same. Yeah. So maybe you know when we look at uh, uh, masks of conquest by uh, Gauri Vishwanathan. Yeah. That's a work which looks at English education, the role of modernity. Yeah. Let's also compare this framework that Iyengar gives us with some of the newer works like that. Okay. So that's all for today.